Hello, this is Tracy Tagaham Espinosa, and this is the Mind-Body Connection. Today we're going to be considering the Mind-Body Connection in global terms, and then comparing this with these other ideas of well-being and quality of life, and what does it mean to have your body in good shape versus your mind, or, or both. And we want to do this within the context of the great range of human variability. There is nobody who wants to try to dictate and say this is the right diet for you or this is the right exercise or this is the right amount of sleep because we know that, that there's huge human variation and that's very normal. So instead of prescribing things we want to look at the risk and protective factors that you as an individual might need to take into consideration when you're trying to find this balance in the mind-body connection. So the three topics we'll look at today have to do with uh, sleep, physical activity, and nutrition. One of the big ideas that we hope that you'll take away from this class is that your mental processes affect your physical states and that your physical body is influenced by how you feel and how you think. We can't just look at the concept of the neuroscience of learning as a purely cognitive concept. I just want to begin with a personal motto when I ran a small office here at a, at a very small liberal arts uh, school here. I would always tell my team members, you know, think in terms of priority, you know, health, family, and work. And, um, you know, keep your health in order and then uh, make sure your family's doing all right and then come to work. And when I know that that's uh, in place, I know that you're going to come 150%. And that's really important because it's evident to me that if you are in ill health or you do have a family problem, uh, you won't be able to work at your best. And in fact, errors can occur when you're not at your, at your best or at your peak and you can't focus on things when you don't have good health. So we know there's a huge connection between what you're able to do in terms of general performance, which is directly linked to your good health. And when we think of health, we think of it on different levels. We think of your physical health, but we also think of it as your mental health. So where did the original idea of the mind-body connection come from? This is uh, René Descartes and his idea of, you know, I think, therefore I am. So I know what I am and what I'm doing because I can be cognitively aware of this. But he uh, made this distinction, this dualism that had more to do with, you know, the, the physical body in contrast with the immaterial mind or thoughts that an individual would have. And if we look at this in sort of a modern day context, he's, you know, dividing what is the body from the spirit and the mind or what is biological to what is psychological. So if we use this as our basic starting point, we can look at the, the idea that this was something that was considered a contrast. And nowadays, we don't look at this as something that is you know, either or, or this happens in comparison with, but rather these are intricate systems that work together. And another twist on the modern view is that we, we throw the brain in here, right? So if you think of the body, uh, your brain is part of your body. Um, so how do we then go from the brain to something that is the mind, that is rather intangible? So we want to take it from this perspective where we're thinking of the mind-body connection. We do want to keep the brain in mind as well. So now let's look at this big idea of well-being and uh, this other idea of quality of life. Um, well-being, you know, before originally in, in much of the literature in the late 60s had to do with, you know, financial well-being. And we've now kind of evolved to look at or consider, you know, well-being is not only just, you know, financial stability, but it also has to do with mental well-being. And we've moved also from this idea of just looking at the, um, at society. Do we have qualities of life in our society or well-being for the group? But also, uh, what does it mean to have in, uh, individual well-being? And this gets complex because you have to try to think, how am I going to measure well-being? So is well-being purely the physical? Does it have to do with the social? Or what does it have to do with my environment, the economic situation, psychological? Basically because you could have well-being in one area but not the other. And that doesn't give you a balance. So there are even some programs that try to break it down for you to say, you know, you're 100% well uh, in your body, but maybe not your, your mind, for example. And so how do you get that perfect balance where everything is really in sync? And there's other people, other programs who have sort of uh, given you a checklist and said, you know, do I have uh, focus time? Am I able to concentrate on things uh, it, to the level that they need to be? Do I have play time where I have leisure, right? Uh, do I have connecting time where I can be with other people or physical time where I can focus on my body or time in where I'm looking internally and, and meditating maybe or thinking about my internal self? Do I have downtime where I'm really just not doing anything? And do I have enough sleep time? All of these things are related to uh, concepts of well-being. And it's very important that all of us think when we're looking at our own personal risk and protective factors, when do we feel at our best? What does it mean to have well-being? And what are the consequences then of what we do to our body that affect our mind and our general well-being in that sense? 
So it's important then to, to ask this big question, you know, is the mind inextricably linked to the body? Uh, if you look at the Gallup's national poll trying to define well-being, they have these big categories, you know, how is our social life and how is control or how is our positive living environment or do we have peace of mind? And all of those things, if you break them down, it's very interesting to see that most of these things, while we might think of them being maybe economically linked, they actually are related very much to you know, the state of the body so that the mind can function well. So we know that, for example, a problem or a risk factor related to well-being in the United States has to do with obesity. But it's interesting, it's connected directly to economics. So income is more to blame for obesity than food choices or what people choose to eat. Uh, we also know that lack of exercise contributes to obesity. So the general risk factor of obesity has many roots to it, all based on choices that your mind makes about what to do to the body, right? So other circumstances also end up being indirectly linked to your body. For example, your work situation. People who are disengaged in work are more likely to smoke, for example. And engaged employees tend to have healthier lifestyles in general. So while you might not think of your work as being directly related to your body, we can see circumstances under which it actually is directly impacted by choices that you'll make. The Gallup poll also identified things about attitudinal things related to uh, gender, optimistic outlook on life, or how emotionally impacting uh, physical hardships are uh, more on, on women, for example, than on men, or at least they're expressed that way. We also know related to economics, of course, you know, having, you know, not having employment leads to depression, and depression leads to deterioration of the body's ability to fight off disease, for example. And other external events, uh, things that can happen to you, uh, earthquakes, um, tornadoes, uh, natural disasters that, that you have no control over can also have, take its toll on your body for various reasons and consequently affect your mind's ability to function in its optimal state. So if we ask this question, is the mind inextricably linked to the body, then we have to also ask, is well-being then linked to the mind-body connection? And if we think of well-being as being this global concept that involves things like your ability to learn or work or have good housing situations or your stable family life. If you think of well-being as being this mixture of all of these different events, then we also have to ask ourselves, does your physical state, does your bodily state uh, influence your ability, for example, to learn or your ability to have financial security, get the job you want, or your ability to have good health or the type of work you can get? So how does your physical state influence your ability to achieve well-being? And we can also ask ourselves, you know, do all of these different sub-elements of well-being depend on a balance uh, between the body and the mind or a positive mind-body connection? And to put this into a more historical perspective, you know, um, Maslow had this idea of a hierarchy of needs back in the 50s. And he suggested that unless basic motivational needs are met, you cannot get to this higher level of uh, interaction, cognition, reflection. So if we don't have basic physiological needs met um, that take care of our bodies, you know, have we eaten enough? Have we slept enough? Have we, uh, do we have a roof over our head, right? If we don't have those basics in place, it's very difficult to move up on the higher level of cognitive abilities. And so your ability to learn would be compromised. So if we look at this from Maslow's perspective, he would basically give it a thumbs up. Yes, it's very important that we have a strong connection, a strong positive connection between a good physical state of our body, a good mental state of our minds in order to reach higher cognitive levels. But thinking about quality of life, it's, it's very hard to measure because it depends on what is valued by the individual. If you look at the literature, there are some things that look at how quality of life actually changed by, by how old you are, right? Or is quality of life good health or is it the absence of illness? We also think of quality, we can think of quality of life as being culturally bound. There's different things that are valued in different cultural settings. And we can also look at quality of life as being relative to your current state. So what is the state of your economy now as compared with 20 years ago? Or what is the state of your country's healthcare system as compared to the past or, or what is promised for the future? So your relative situation can also lend itself to, to an interpretation of what quality of life actually means. So if we look at this as complementary terms, what is the difference then between well-being and quality of life? Many countries actually do a quality of life index. Uh, in Europe, they have a, uh, the Eurostats actually collect information on what is quality of life in Europe. We also see that there's quality of life as measured. For example, this is the New Hampshire state um, evaluation. Quality of life re uh, relates to your standard of living or uh, your family structure or the level of crime in your neighborhood, or your personal health. So 
these are definitions uh, in very macro terms of quality of life. The difference really being in macro and micro concepts, right? So quality of life measures that have a lot to do with things that you don't have a lot of control over. So the crime rate in your neighborhood, for example. Uh, whereas well-being has to do with things that you actually can take control over. So if we look at quality of life as this more global thing that involves elements of the economy, culture, welfare, and environment, this concept of well-being um, and health is, is, very much, is very much something that's uh, managed at the level of an individual. So the big question is then how can you improve well-being and improve your quality of life? So, you know, you can take this approach of doing a basic checklist, you know, looking at the dimensions of quality of life and, and, uh, or stages or steps to improving your quality of life. Or you can take this reflective stage and decide that, you know, it's not really possible for somebody else to dictate to you what would be the measurements of your well-being or your quality of life. Why? Because we have to look at this huge idea of human variability. What might be good for you might not be good for me. So if we ask ourselves, is there a single formula for well-being or quality of life? We might say that, you know, most human beings, going back to Maslow's idea, right? Most human beings really need these basic needs met before they can go up higher on the scale. But when you look at those basic needs, you'll also find that there's a huge range of human variability within all of those things. So, so it does behoove each individual to really think about, you know, what is it, what are the risk and protective factors in my setting that create quality of life for me based on these different elements that impact my body that influence my mind. So key message, there is no one size fits all prescription. You know, there's no perfect diet that suits everyone. There's no perfect sleep pattern that satisfies everybody. There's no exercise regime that responds to everybody's body. And this is basically because we're all individual. You are unique. Remember we talked about this in week one and two related to your your genome and your phenotype and how this is all impacted by the environment you live in. So different people are going to combine these needs in different ways. Your own personal recipe for what is quality of life based on this balance between your, your body and your mind will be unique even though we can say there are certain parameters. So what we'd like to do is to ask you to reflect during this class on the different risk and protective factors. Remember we discussed this in one of the first classes. Those things that enhance the probability of blocking a natural state would be a risk factor. What is it that's keeping you from having this great balance uh, between your body and mind? And what are the things that are actually protective factors that help promote a natural state of learning. We'd also want you to think about this from a very macro state to also down to your micro state. So we'll re reflect on this big question. What are some of the risk and protective factors in your life related to the mind-body connection? And we'll look at these three areas right now and I'd like you to keep a pencil by your side and jot down some of the things that you find are risk or protective factors in your own personal context. So if we look at sleep, there are certain characteristics of sleep that are important to understand. Most humans spend about 25% of their time in the sleep state, in the rapid eye movement or REM state in which you are dreaming. And sleep typically occurs in cycles. Um, people normally call these four stages of sleep. Some people call it five when you're actually in full awake state. But these different cycles of sleep, and each time you go through one of these cycles, it takes about 90 minutes. There are people who can actually shorten their sleep cycles, which is why some people can sleep short amounts of time, but still have the benefits of going through all of the stages of sleep. There are distinct physical areas related to sleep versus dreaming. So REM sleep is controlled by the pontine brainstem mechanisms. Dreaming is controlled by forebrain mechanisms, which is really, really interesting. It's very different. So if we say is REM sleep always equal to dreaming, this means that REM can occur with or without dreaming. So REM is not 100% always dreaming. So REM can occur with or without dreaming. And dreaming and REM itself are actually controlled by different mechanisms. REM is controlled by, by brainstem mechanisms and dreams seem to be controlled by dopaminergic forebrain mechanisms. Having said that, uh, if I were to wake you up in a REM state, if I'm looking at a person and they, their eyes are moving under their eyelids, right, as if they're watching a movie, they're in rapid eye movement state. Um, if you wake up somebody in, in that state, um, almost every single time you do that, they are waking up from a dream. So if they're in REM, they're actually waking up for a dream state. However, dreaming is also present uh, in, in a small percentage of non-REM awakenings as well. So in general, you know, we can't say you know, it's 100%, but there is a high correlation between REM sleep and dreaming. 
So there's not only different changes that you'll see related to the electrical activity in the brain, the stages of sleep are measured by electrical activity, but they're also modulated by chemical changes in the brain. So according to Hobbes and studies, REM sleep is mediated by acetylcholine when noradrenaline and serotonin are at low levels. And dreaming shows an association with a lack of noradrenaline and serotonin in the REM sleep activated brain. And this is important to know why, because noradrenaline and serotonin are known to be necessary for attention, for learning, and for memory. So if we look at different networks of the brain, there's a different cortical areas. When a person is actually hallucinating, you'll see a lot of activity in the parietal lobes, and this is associated with dream states. So in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, so when someone enters a dream state, there's reduced memory, there's confused direction of thought, there's decrease of self-reflective awareness, and a decrease in logical reasoning that occurs while someone is dreaming. So the big question is always, you know, why do people sleep? We know that there's at least two big reasons. One is to take care of your body, and the other is to take care of your mind. Most people find it instinctive to say that your body needs to rest, that you need to be physically attentive, therefore your body needs to rest. This is very true, but how is it that your body regenerates physically? This has a lot to do with thermal regulation. So when dreaming, acetylcholine is present, and effectively this allows the brain to or re to reduce the level of thermal regulation, and this allows the body to regenerate physically. So related to the brain and mind, we know that the REM sleep um, subserves the consolidation of memories. This is um, began by Hobson and now uh, continued now by uh, Stickles' work at Harvard that shows that there's a combination of neurotransmitters in the brain that's present, um, uniquely present during REM sleep that actually solidifies memories in the brain. Remember we mentioned this in class uh, that you might have as a teacher, you might have a student who stayed up all night or you yourself as students might have stayed up all night and you show up to the test and you take the test and you do great on the test. And then you go home, flop on the bed, and you go to sleep for a while. You might do great on the test, but if I ask you the exact same question about 24 hours later, uh, you won't remember anything because you did not sleep on it. You did not consolidate that memory and pass it to long-term memory, which is what really counts for learning. So this brings us to the main idea of why sleep and dreaming are very important to learning. We know that memory and attention are vital to learning. If you don't have memory, you don't have learning. If you don't have attention, you don't have learning. Well, dreaming permits for the consolidation of memory, and sleep allows for focused attention. So both of those things contribute to your learning outcomes. And related to this, sleep impacts your active working memory, and dreaming impacts your long-term memory. So both sleep and dreaming are related to memory systems, as well as to attention systems. So sleep permits the body to, and the mind to be focused and to pay attention. Sleep also permits the body and the mind to perform consistently. Anybody who's had a lack of sleep understands you know, that you can sort of get away with it short term. If you're really interested in your activity and you're focused, highly motivated, you can get away with sleeping less than what is your personal normal. However, you know, there'll be a bill to pay later on. You know, sleep curtailment compromises your ability to be attentive, to organize, to read, to write, to listen, to tell. So you really need to have those skill sets in place, and you can only do that if you have a good night's sleep. If you have sleep deprivation for long periods of time, let's say for, um, you know, two to three days long, you'll end up having really bizarre dreams due to your, your brain being bathed in certain neurotransmitters that are just waiting to be released, right? Sleep deprivation also leads to negative things for your body. There's higher risk of infection, uh, loss of um, body temperature regulation. So we know that there, you pay a, a price for not sleeping what is normal for you. And we say you pay a price when you don't sleep what is normal for you. There are people who are short sleepers, you know, they sleep four to six hours a day. That's no more abnormal or unusual than long sleepers, people who sleep, you know, eight, 10, 12 hours a day. The average might be eight hours, but that is not necessarily what anybody really does. And we also have to take into consideration that people don't always sleep the same amount each day. And the structure of sleep, you know, based on social uh, customs or climate or your own personal experience, will change your sleep patterns. Uh, an interesting study by Hobson that's not reported here today, but I'd like to share it with you, is that when he did experiments with people in uh, sensory deprivation tanks, when they had no sense of what time of day it was, they couldn't hear things that gave them uh, an indication as to the time of day, they didn't see the sunlight. People in those situations actually slept something closer to a 25-hour cycle instead of a 24-hour cycle. And basically nobody will sleep eight hours. Most people will sleep for about four or five hours and then they'll get up and they'll be up for about four or five hours, six hours, then they'll go back to sleep for a few more hours and then they'll wake up again. This idea of having a eight hour pattern of sleep and then going to work for eight hours 
is very much socially contrived. It's something that your human body might not naturally do on its own. Finally, I want to introduce this idea of efficient or productive sleep. There are records in history of people who basically say they can resolve problems in their sleep. Uh, Einstein, Tchaikovsky, there were many people who, had, who said they did their best creative work while they were sleeping. While no new learning can take place while you're asleep, uh, like you can't put a tape recording under your head and you can uh, and learn Arabic by tomorrow morning, that just doesn't happen. You can review information you have already learned in a conscious state. So this is why people can say, yes, I've woken up and I have resolved this problem, or I went to bed with this idea and I've now uh, come to a better uh, conclusion about that idea. As sleep is a behavior, like all behaviors, it can be modified. So you can learn to sleep more efficiently, you can change your pattern of sleep, and you can also learn to be productive in your sleep. So when can productive sleep take place? If you look at Hobson's work, he suggests that during lucid dreaming, um, basically just before you're about to fall into sleep, it's this moment when you know you're not really asleep, but you know you're not really awake, um, it's almost a meditative state, so just before you go into a sleep stage, um, you can give yourself an idea. You can consider something. You can rehearse something in your mind, think this is something I'd like to, to think about or dream about. So this is a moment. This is the moment of sleep onset, which he suggests is a particularly fruitful time to decide what you'd like to dream. So let's say, though, however, you, let's just say that you don't want to um, resolve a problem, but let's say that you want to dream of flying or that you want to do something uh, that's particularly interesting to you, that attracts you. This would be a wonderful dream to have. That's the moment that you should uh, give yourself that idea. Unfortunately, because most uh, many people have poor sleep hygiene, you fall asleep watching the TV or for some other reason, you don't take the time to train yourself to sleep better. So if I were to ask you during, during productive sleep, you know, what are some of the ways that dreams can be used to solve problems? And who are some of the people that you've heard of that have used their dreams to solve problems? And what are some of the characteristics of problems that can be solved while sleeping? Are they concrete problems? Are they abstract problems? Are they questions of form? Do they have to do with content? Remember, you cannot do any new learning in sleep, but you can resolve problems based on tools that you already have in your conscious state. Finally, the last point has to do with sleep throughout the lifespan. Uh, we do know that um, sleep decreases throughout the lifespan. Um, at 26 weeks of gestation, when the baby is still inside the mother, the baby will be in REM state almost 24 hours. That's something really interesting to look into, right? And newborns spend an average of about 16 hours a day in REM, and one-year-olds 12 hours a day sleeping and about three hours in REM. But when you get down to being a bit older, hit about 30, 40, 50, 70 years old, People sleep far less, and they, but their REM sleep regulates, goes anywhere from an hour and a half to two and a half hours of REM sleep. So what is happening there? Is this a, due to a change in balance of hormones? Is this due to a change of, in, uh, in a lack of need for sleep states? Why is it that older adults then sleep far less than younger adults would? So to wrap up the sleep portion, I want to show you a quick video on what is good sleep hygiene. It's just a four-minute video, but it talks about some of the key elements related to sleeping well. And I'd like to ask you if you personally believe that you have good sleep hygiene. Most people when asked will tell you they just don't sleep enough. Um, almost nobody feels like they sleep enough. So is there some way that you can retrain yourself to sleep better or are there things that are preventing you uh, in your environment from sleeping well? So let's look at this video and then we'll have a think about that right afterwards. <music> This is Sleep Better TV. I'm Scott Drake, and we welcome back into the studio my guest, Dr. Jacques Hebert. Once again, he practices dentistry and treats sleep breathing disorders in Montreal, Quebec. Now, this time we're talking about sleep hygiene. Uh, Dr. Hebert, welcome back. What exactly is sleep hygiene? Sleep is a part of our life that we seem to get less and less as we go along with our busy life and very uh, busy schedule. Um, there's, there's no reason w why we shouldn't be able to get a good night's sleep. And you don't have to be uh, a snorer or a, uh, have a diagnosis of sleep apnea uh, to make changes and then to be able to get a good night's sleep. Even people who don't suffer from this condition can benefit from making simple changes around bedtime to get a good night's sleep. A series of simple recommendations and changes to get a better, good, a better night's sleep um, are basically what we call sleep hygiene. 
Uh, can you give us some good recommendations for proper sleep hygiene? Some of those recommendations are as follow. First one should be to get a regular schedule, meaning that try, you're trying to go to bed at the same time every night and also wake up at the same time every morning. This just settles everything around and so you're more relaxed when it comes time to go to bed and wake up in the morning. Uh, second one, um, the bedroom should be used only for sleep and intimacy. Uh, don't bring your computer to bed, it, won't, it will stop you from going to sleep. Um, third one, if you lay awake in bed trying to fall asleep, limit that to 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, if you're not asleep, get out of the room, go do something, and just come back to the bedroom only when you feel sleepy and ready to go to bed. Uh, another one, the bedroom should be uh, dark, should be peaceful, well, no, no loud noise, and should be set at very cool temperature. Also, uh, you have to avoid drinking um, alcohol beverages at least three to five hours prior to going to bed. Also, ca caffeine, limit your consumption of cafe or caffeine to two, one to two cups a day and then no later than six hours before going to bed. And then we all know that exercise is very good for you. You should exercise daily, but you have to avoid strenuous exercise routine at least three hours uh, or three and a half hours before going to bed. Finally, what are some signs of poor sleep hygiene? The main indicators of what we would call poor sleep hygiene are excessive daytime sleepiness or fatigue, or just simply having problems finish our day and then just getting back to the, to ho at home at night and then feeling like we're exhausted. It could also be um, problems falling asleep or even staying asleep. Or uh, most of the time also people will mention that they suffer from frequent awakening. They wake up often during the night and they go back to sleep and they awake again. And uh, it's basically everything that will disturb your sleep and make you um, fatigued during the day. Those are the, the signs that we usually look at to start with. My guest has been Dr. Jacques Hebert, who practices dentistry and sleep breathing disorder therapy in Montreal, Quebec. Dr. Hebert, thank you again. Well, thank you for inviting me. You're watching Sleep Better TV. You can see more at sleepbetter.tv. Thanks for watching. And that's a good transition then into the next topic that has to do with physical activity. So what is physical activity? If I were to ask you, can you name all the things that you might do in a day that are physical activity? And so it pretty much ranges from absolutely everything from, you know, calm, you know, sitting, uh, meditative activities, uh, doing uh, martial arts, to doing anything super active uh, and intensive uh, extreme sports. So all of that can be considered physical activity. And people are quick to associate benefits of physical activity with your body, but does this also help your mind or your brain? The Center for D Disease Control and Prevention notes that there's benefits of physical activity that have to do with weight control, uh, risk for cardiovascular disease, uh, risk, uh, reducing risk for diabetes, and for some cancers, and for strengthening muscle tone. All of those things are physically related, but are there things that are related to physical activity and improvement related to the mind connection as well as to the body? People are always uh, reflecting now, what is the right amount of physical activity? If you look at different government bodies, they might suggest things. Uh, for example, if you do two hours and 30 minutes or 150 minutes a week of brisk walking, for example, or if you do two or more days a week that where you're working all of your muscle groups, your legs, your hips, your back, your abdomen, or 75 minutes a week doing something like jogging, or two days a week uh, if you do a lot of strenuous exercise uh, through all of your different body parts, legs, hips, back, um, abdomen, chest, shoulders, arms, or alternatively if you do aerobic activity one, once or twice a week. These are general guidelines and recommendations, and obviously different people will need different things and different people will enjoy things. Um, some people just love doing physical exercise and they can do, you know, every single day of the week, do something and feel really good about it. And other people really find that they push themselves. So there's other alternatives. There's these um, exercise pyramids or these physical exercise pyramids that says, well, you can either do this or you can do that, or you can do this or you can do that. So, you know, if on a daily basis you're, you know, you're walking and taking care of your garden, 
that's okay. That's pretty much as, you know, just as well as if you, you know, twice a week did some, you know, some heavy aerobic exercise. So the idea is that this should be part of your weekly routine. Are you fitting in physical exercise in order to reap the benefits uh, to, for your body, but also for your mind? So we know related to the neurochemistry of um, exercise that there's an uh, increase in norepinephrine, serotonin, acetylcholine, and GABA. These different neurotransmitters, as you can, as you recall, and you can also look back at the section on neurotransmitters, are very beneficial and are directly related to aspects of learning. So how does the physical activity improve cognitive functioning? One of the key ways, aside from these other neurotransmitters just mentioned, has to do with brain-derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF, which is related to nerve growth, neurogenesis, and is very key in long-term memory. This is shown to increase during not only environmental enrichment, so maybe at a cognitive level, but also due to physical exercise. But this, like all of the other things we're mentioning, can be risk or protective factors. So you can have factors will put at risk the BDNF if you are depressed, for example. Um, but it can be a protective factor if you have an enhanced physical activity, for example, an active state. So we know that BDNF is very important for learning, and it can be influenced by both your mental state as well as what you do to your body physically. So there's multiple studies that show that um, BDNF is, is shown to increase with, with physical exercise. So this is well documented in the literature. In the earlier studies, you'll find that a lot of this has a lot to do with um, other non-human creatures, but now we have a lot of evidence, especially through sports medicine analysis, of how this actually is improved in human beings. To give you a global sense of how physical exercise can improve potential for learning, I'd like to show you a quick video. Exercise is interesting in terms of effects on the brain because it, it, it works in about four or five different ways. Uh, one of the most obvious ways is blood flow. And so if you uh, get your heart working, your brain's going to be filled with um, oxygen-rich blood and nutrients. So that's the main way that, that we thought it helps. The other way that's sort of interesting uh, is it's been thought that exercise produces uh, new neurons. And so exercise induces the production of growth factors, one, one's called BDNF, and it actually stimulates the production of new brain cells. Now, when I was in school 20 years ago, we were told you can't get any new brain cells. So when you're born, that's your lot. You know, you're not going to make any more. But more recently, we found that uh, exercise is a really good way of, of stimulating brain cell production. And some of these are functional. And so um, just this notion that something that you can do can generate new brain cells is, is a really great uh, uh, th th thing to think about. So we, we were wondering why exercise helps the brain. And what one theory is it just reduces stress. So maybe it's not that uh, your blood is coming to the brain, maybe you're less stressed and then, you know. And that, that was something that imaging allowed us to test. And so we scanned a whole lot of people with high cortisol levels. And so if you're stressed, if you're you're angry about something, or even if you're stuck in traffic, your cortisol levels can be very high. But one of the things we found is that the people with high uh, cortisol levels lost brain tissue faster. Well, that's a serious problem. So as soon as you know that's true, you can look at ways of reducing your cortisol. And so that's a very easy thing to do. I mean, we, we can get less stressed by um, exercising, walking, taking breaks. And so imaging established a physical connection between something in your blood, the cortisol that's a sign of stress, and actual physical changes in the brain. That's very useful to know. Take care of your brain. And, and uh, there's a lot of ways we know that you can take care of your brain. You can eat a good diet, uh, you can exercise. You can reduce stress, um, you can make sure you're well educated. And these things just build up a sort of mental bank account for the future. And so e even though it seems like uh, you know, work is hard, I mean, you're building a store of brain connections that you'll need for the rest of your life. So these are practical messages that we've learned from imaging a lot of people. So, so this begs the question, you know, what types of exercise would actually be beneficial or what could we recommend with without reservation? And there seems to be a lot of studies related to aerobic exercise, but there's a big debate that's still out whether or not they should be short-term intensive aerobic exercise or if these should be very prolonged aerobic exercise for longer periods of time. But in general, you know, we know that acute intermediate intensive exercise for not too long of a time seems to show in several studies that this is beneficial to your brain. In a key study by Chad Kamen and colleagues, which looked at young children, uh, 7 to 10 years old, they wanted to see if, what was the relationship between physical activity, aerobic fitness, cognition, and the brain. Um, and it was noted that you know higher fit children, kids who are already in shape, they had larger brain volumes in the basal ganglia and hippocampus, which have to do with long-term memory. And they also found that higher fit children also show superior brain function during tasks of cognitive control, better scores on tests, and higher performance in real-world tasks compared to children who are less fit. So 
obviously the big question when you look at research is, okay, what caused what? You know, were they fit and then that caused better cognition or were they just smart, which is why they stayed fit? So it's the chicken and the egg thing. We're not quite sure what it does, but there does seem to be a positive correlation between physical activity, aerobic fitness, and cognition in the brain. If we look at the cell biology and immunology related to exercise, some fascinating new studies out, this was, uh, this was just out last December, showed that exercise initiated in early life increases gut bacterial species involved in promoting psychological and metabolic health. They showed that exercise during this early developmental period promoted optimal brain and metabolic functions across the lifespan. So again, just like other things, when we say, you know, the earlier the better, it's never too late, but the earlier the better may be beneficial to long-term physical as well as mental health. Finally, there's a large group of studies related to exercise and cognitive decline. There is evidence that exercise serves to stave off cognitive decline, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease, also thanks to BDNF. So this is especially important to take into consideration as the world has a aging population. We have learned very uh, to a pretty you know, high extent how to take care of our bodies. What we have not been able to do is perfect how to take care of our minds that go along with these aging bodies. So people are getting older and older, but are we offering them quality of life? If we keep your body alive, but your brain, but your mind is gone, you know, what, what does that mean? Is that really quality of life? I'll share with you parenthetically that I am, um, I come from pretty good stock. You know, my mother's mother died when she was uh, 98 years old. So my grandmother, her mind was so sharp until the day she died. She was terribly sharp. But about uh, 10 years before she died, she would start to complain bitterly about her body. And she just, you know, she even told me once on the phone, you know, I don't think human beings were meant to live this long. Um, she goes, I can't get my body to do what it, what it needs to be doing now. I don't know why, it just doesn't cooperate. I was like, well, you're 98 years old. That's why your body's not cooperating. But in the case then of though my, my great-grandfather on my father's side, my father's mother's father, my paternal grandfather. My father's father also lived to be uh, 97 years old, um, but his, uh, his mind went before his body went. And um, it, this was really hard on all of us. So it's very hard to know how can we find this compatibility level where you've got your mind and your body in sync. About 10 years before he went, we would go and visit and he would look at us and he would say things like, um, I don't remember your name, but I know I like you. <laughs> and so, you know, he's losing it. And he was, you know, this handsome guy, very charming fellow, but he lost it mentally before he lost it physically. And, and so in the case of my mother's mother, she lost it, you know, physically before she lost it mentally. So, you know, nobody knows exactly what the best way is to go, but ideally, you know, you could have in sync this, you know, optimal body functioning as well as your optimal brain functioning for as long as possible. So this big questions of looking at physical exercise in aging populations is a very big uh, area of research right now that is, uh, is very promising, very interesting, and, and well worth looking into. A study done by Erickson and colleagues noted that uh, physical activity is a promising intervention that can influence endogenous pharmacology of the brain to enhance cognitive and emotional function in late adulthood. So whereas we say the general rule is start as early as possible to, to get in these habituated actions of taking care of your body, you can even start late and after four or five years of intervention, they found that there was definite benefits. Okay, now we're going to turn to the last topic that has to do with nutrition. Uh, and the big question is always, you know, what's the diet for the brain? What should we actually eat for your brain? And you get a lot of people who are really willing to tell you all this great advice and say, oh, this, do this, do that, do the other thing. The problem is they're not really all saying the same thing. They're all saying kind of different things. So this leaves us, you know, wondering what is really the, the perfect diet for your brain? And um, again, there is no such thing because depending on your individual physiology, you're going to maybe need things different from somebody else. There was a recent article that came out last week um, on the best diet for your brain. And the bottom line of the article is basically saying there is no perfect diet, but there are a lot of good indicators now. So I want to share some of those findings with you. So the authors of this article found that people who eat well tend to have other healthy habits as well. So this makes you wonder whether or not just having a healthy diet is really what's uh, taking care of that brain or not, or it's the combination of having a healthy diet and also uh, doing exercise and having good sleep hygiene that's actually benefiting the individual. And they also note at the outset, you know, good eating also does reduce things such as depression. And um, straight away, there's no doubt so diets that include fish with high omega-3 fatty acids have been recommended pretty much across the board. 
What are other things that they found? So aside from the the omega-3s, they found that fermented foods such as yogurt, pickles, sauerkraut, they also help things like anxiety and things like green tea and antioxidant fruits. In longer term studies, they are indicating that they may help uh, keep dementia at bay. There are other researchers who are looking at the connection, uh, not only for depression, but for other emotional states, as well as to cardiovascular disease. Those things are pretty straightforward. Your brain is an organ, just like you know your heart. So if you have no other rule of thumb, the best idea is to go, what's good for your heart is probably good for your brain. What Jack and colleagues found, and this is um, true with many studies, it's always easier to prove something negative rather than something positive, is that Western diets appear to reduce the size of a left hippocampus, meaning it's worse for your brain and memory things. There's also other studies cited here that have to do with this uh, fellow, I don't know if you recall, he went on a 10-day binge and only ate McDonald's and showed that he had higher levels of fatigue and other things. So it's easier to prove a negative than it is to prove a positive or, or, or to get away from correlational studies and look at causal studies. In this article, they do a comparison between three very popular diets that have been touted as being good for your brain, the Mediterranean diet, the Okinawan diet, and the Scandinavian diet. Um, what they seem to have in common is that fruits, vegetables, nuts, whole grains, fish, lean meats in moderation, olive oil, a little red wine here and there, those things tend to appear in all of these diets and tend to be beneficial for the individual. Pelertia and, and colleagues also found that the Mediterranean diet may actually preserve neuronal connections in the brain. So this may be beneficial in, in maintaining the connections between neurons in the brain. And Morris and colleagues also found that combining the Mediterranean diet with uh, also just low salts may help slow cognitive decline and possibly help uh, prevent Alzheimer's. Um, they did a study on 960 adults so over five years' time, and they found that people who were on this Mediterranean diet with also less salt achieved scores matching those of people seven and a half years younger. So there is something to this over time. They're finding in these longitudinal studies that a change in diet can be beneficial, even if the change in diet happens uh, in old age itself. Let's have a quick look at another video that summarizes some of the best ideas that we have now about nutrients in the brain. Let me tell you how miserable my mornings are without breakfast. I hate everyone. Yes, everyone. Even that old lady who took the last seat on the train. I hate you. Hey guys, Julie here for D News. Do we need breakfast? I mean, your mom always tells you you need to eat it, but do you really need to? A recent study published in the Journal of Public Economics says yes. The researchers found that schools that provided free breakfast for their students had better test scores than those that didn't. The kids performed 25% better in math and had similar gains in other areas like reading. But this news isn't entirely new. Breakfast is often heralded as the most important meal of the day, and science backs this up. There are loads of studies that show just how important it is for learning and memory, but it might not have the weight loss benefits you think. Anyways, is it breakfast that helps give your brain a boost, or is it the type of food you eat? I mean, the brain consumes a lot of energy. Almost 20% of the energy we consume goes to the brain. Some researchers say that the brain functions best when there's 25 grams of glucose circulating through the bloodstream. So really, you should keep that as level as possible. Any spike or dip can leave you feeling off. So maybe eating more frequent, smaller meals throughout the day can help you avoid a post-lunch crash. But is there a way to hack your brain with food? Is there such a thing as brain food? I mean, I was always told to eat a banana before a test. Curcumin and omega-3 seem to be buzzing around the blogosphere of late, and that may have some truth to it. According to a paper published in the National Review of Neuroscience, these nutrients lessen cognitive decline in the elderly and improve cognition in people with brain injuries. Your typical sources of omega-3 are in fish, like salmon, and in other things like flax seeds and walnuts. Curcumin can be found mostly in turmeric, a type of spice. Other nutrients, like iron and B vitamins, help memory and brain function in women, while diets high in saturated fats tend to do the opposite. Omega-3s and other micronutrients might be the heavy hitters of brain food. One study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition found that a cocktail of omega-3s, iron, zinc, folate, and vitamins A, B6, B12, and C helped kids in Australia and Indonesia do better on learning and memory tests. Another study published in the journal Appetite by some of the same researchers found that foods low on the glycemic index are better for breakfast. The glycemic index rates food based on how it affects your glucose levels or level of sugar. The study found that yes, kids' memory and cognitive function do decline throughout the morning, but a low GI breakfast reduced that decline more than a breakfast with a high GI. Low GI foods are like fruits and vegetables or maybe even oatmeal. So a good breakfast might be a bowl of oatmeal with a banana rather than a bowl of sugary cereal. So a balanced diet with fish and fruits and veggies seems to be good for the brain. 
Eating breakfast might keep you perkier in the morning, so you're more alert to learn more. So before a big test, eat a good breakfast, no not sugary cereals. What is your go-to test food? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, hit those like and subscribe buttons and keep coming back here. We've got new episodes every day of the week. Okay, so some things we can debate about in that video, but summarizing a lot of the big ideas that we were just trying to present here. There's another thing that's very important, and it was mentioned in this last video of certain vitamins, but it's very important to remember, um, Emily Deans at the Harvard Medical School points out that it's better to get your nutrients from food rather than supplements. So, you know, bottom line and always a good guide is as close to its source as possible in order to maintain the, the key nutrients that are in the foods you're ingesting. So there exists an International Society for Nutritional Psychiatry Research. What they point out is that the emerging and compelling evidence for nutrition as a crucial factor in the high prevalence and incidence of mental disorders. So, so if we look at this as a grand continuum of whether or not you're basically looking at nutrients in order to sustain or maintain a basic level or to learn even more, this is actually saying this is a protective factor for things that might be negative for mental disorders. So they suggest that diet is as important to psychiatry as it is to cardiology, endocrinology, and gastroenterology. But the big question again, we keep going back to this idea, is there such a thing as a perfect diet? Um, and if I ask you this, um, I would like to also attach to this idea, uh, are, they, are diets culturally bound? Not everybody has all foods in all places. You know, recommending everybody eat salmon all the time is a great idea if, if your country has salmon that's easily accessible or, you know, not out of your price range. So if we look at this from a cultural vantage point, it's also pretty interesting. In the left, you'll have uh, Harvard's new idea of a healthy eating plate. And getting away from the typical pyramid, they went on to look at proportions or based on how your plate might look now, not in a, as a pyramid. But we have a larger and larger number of people who are becoming vegetarians or vegans. So here we have a vegan pyramid. Then you have things that look like a Mediterranean diet, which includes things down here at the bottom, um, like so, da so down here you have dancing as well as, you know, high level of socializing, which is part of the diet. Um, if you look in Japan, though, they have an inverted pyramid, which is, look, which is also very interesting. What kinds of things do you really need, including your exercise level, the proportions of things that you should have in your daily fare? In the more traditional food pyramid, this is how it was divided before we had this plate that, the, that Harvard has now. This is considered an Iranian diet, which has a, a far greater number of fruits and vegetables, meat proteins that don't come from things like fish, uh, but they do have things with chicken, for example. And then a, a typical Asian diet pyramid. So instead of putting all these breads and grains, they'll have more things that are more like rice and noodles. So anyways, on the whole, you can say that the general nutrients that you might find are going to be relatively similar because humans need more or less the same kinds of things. But it's really important to consider, you know, that there's uh, there's no real perfect diet because they will have uh, lots of cultural considerations and also your access to certain foods. So remember I told you uh, when we began this, that there were many people who were willing to give a lot of advice about what the best diet would be for your brain, but you really do have to consider um, also cultural restraints in those recommendations. So we end by looking at this idea again, remembering, reminding ourselves that, you know, there's huge uh, human variability. And so there's nothing that's going to be 100% for all people all the time in all places. So now let's look at yourself. What are your risk and protective factors? And do limit it for the, the, for the sake of this reflection to these three areas of sleep, physical activity, nutrition. Obviously, there's other things that have to do with your mind, body, balance, including things like, you know, sex and shelter and all these other things we haven't talked about. But let's limit it, limit your reflection to these three areas of sleep, physical activity, and nutrition. What are the risk factors in your life right now? Is, is your sleep hygiene at risk? Is your physical activity at risk? For what reasons? Nutrition-wise, what, uh, what is the risk factor that's involved there? Or do you have protective factors that are balancing things out and that are giving you that leg up? So have you mindfully incorporated protective factors into your practice so that you can take care of your body so your body can take care of your mind so that your mind can take care of your body you know in this infinite circle what is the balance of your risk and protective factors related to the mind body connection so i want to invite you know take a moment think about those risk factors think about the protective factors and how you might be able to move yourself towards a better balance of elements related to sleep physical activity and nutrition in your life with that, we end. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please shoot me an email, and I'll see you next week.